And that, I use every birthday as an opportunity to like write a letter to myself and reflect a little bit about the prior year. And I, I get asked these kinds of questions a lot because my uh, creative resume is so odd. I, I feel like I'm kind of a moving target. I did. Cre I was a creative writer in high school. I wrote plays in high school. I came to college, started getting into fiction, wrote journalism, became a professional journalist for a while, then went to graduate school for fiction writing. And while there, I got a second MFA in playwriting and finished. I started writing screenplays in college, which had been this secret dream, and then finished, began my grad program beginning the work on Kill Your Darlings, which I'm sure I'll talk about later. So then suddenly, three years out of grad school, I'm writing short stories, plays produced, I'm working on this film. I got into solo performance and monologue performance because I just didn't want to wait for theaters to tell me I was ready to do work. It just seemed like it's, it's almost like deciding to make a band with yourself because you can play all the instruments. And I can be the body, I can be the voice, I can be the writer. And uh, it's pretty strange though. I, I think it's very natural actually to want to be a writer in a bunch of different forms, but I find it very rare. Most I don't have a lot of colleagues that understand what it means to work in multiple genres. So when I think about my bio, I mean, I, it, for, I should say, you know, for anyone listening, I mean, it's a very, it's a privilege to be here and I'm so honored to talk to you about this stuff because the, the, my biography as a creative writer probably begins very much my sophomore year of college because I'd never really had a professor who um, had given me rigorous feedback that wasn't totally accepting or tolerating of, you know, bad, bad choices and limited writing. I did recently read some of it and found it a young man's prose, but your responses were very like loving and generous in other ways. And that probably was the carrot that, you know, at the, at the end of a very long stick that gave me faith. So in college, I came to college very much as a reader. And I think poignantly as a college professor now, I, I think that, that, that species is, is, is endangered. I think most students don't come to college as readers, actually. They're, they're much more screenagers, and they'd, they'd rather digest via the screen. Um, <clears throat> but that said, my father was a French professor and uh, gave me The Stranger as a young man and turned me on to Hemingway. He very much admired Hemingway. And so I had read a lot of those books as a, as a teenager and even a little bit younger than a teenager, maybe like in 10, you know, as a 10 years old, 11 years old, I'd started reading early Hemingway, trying to tease out what it all meant. My mom was a Spanish literature professor at uh, Drew University in New Jersey. And so she, her field of research was Don Quixote and Golden Age literature, which uh, has become fantasy and speculative fiction has been a part of my creative writing and as a writer as I've gone on in my life. And my dad was very interested in words and language. They were both language professors at a basic level. So I, I grew up with being really interested in language. And that actually made me a really natural playwright. So when I was in high school, where I grew up in Madison, New Jersey, there was the Playwrights Theater of New Jersey. They had a high school playwriting program. And I was really lucky to, to get involved with that because it meant that you could write your plays and see them performed. And that's very rare. Uh, also, theater is such a uh, challenged form right now because the theaters themselves are quite, you know, struggle financially. And a lot of young people think they understand theater because they understand television, but it's a really different form. So I grew up with a lot of theater in my life. And I look back now and the books that meant so much to me, you know, were not actually what most people would be considered literature. You know, for example, like Danny Dunn, where were these adventure books about a redheaded like detective who would always like get shrunk down to the size of a quarter and or would like ride on the back of a bird or something. But they were the kind of, like, I use this word a lot, permission giving kind of literature where anything could happen. And I read those just ferociously, choose your own adventures, the same thing of this genre where you, you pick a path through the narrative, uh, almost like literary video games a little bit. This was in the mid 80s and late 80s. So, and then I graduated to people like Hemingway and then finally to these triumvirate of amazing writers in college of whom none of my undergraduates even know who they are. I mean, so yeah, we're talking about Tobias Wolff and Carver and, and Ford, who were the giants of my time. And unfortunately, they're difficult, they're difficult uh, giants to kind of follow in their footsteps because in a way, the, I don't know, the spirit of minimalism or whatever you might want to call the genre, I suppose you wouldn't necessarily group Ford in that, and maybe not even Wolff, but a very narrow abject realism really didn't leave a lot of ground for imagination. And I found myself, that was kind of a dead trail for me as I tried to imitate it. Um, so Cormac McCarthy kind of blew that one up. My father, I can remember sitting me down in the quad at Yale, he'd come for a visit and handed me this New York Times magazine profile of Cormac McCarthy. And I was just like, who is this guy? And then I began reading the books and there was like a spell that fell over me and I moved out west. I lived in Missoula, Montana for a summer. 
I started researching, you know, the West and specifically Charlie Syringo, who was this cowboy balladeer who had written a memoir and then turned into a Pinkerton detective. That was my senior thesis was this screenplay based on the life of this oddball cowboy detective who had been caught in this union strike in Coeur d'Alene. Probably because my father had given me these books by Cormac McCarthy that, proved, that said to me like the West was the cauldron of American writers. So then I graduated and I don't know what the hell to do with my life. I think like most creative writers, you don't really know. So I started working as a journalist and I'm very, I'm very thankful to have made that decision because I had a lot of adventures and had my ego crushed. <clears throat> and actually my writing, I became a lot more rigorous and uh, almost athletic with my writing in terms of being able to produce on deadline and having to interview 15 people and come up with some kind of thesis statement. I will look back. I always say that the Yale undergraduate experience was actually really bad for synthesizing. We weren't taught to understand people. We were taught to completely shred them. So that's actually, it's difficult. I ask students now to often just tell me, what's the story of a story? Because they're not good at that. They don't read it for the story. Anyhow, so then I graduated and became a journalist. And um, my interests were always in subcultures, I think, as a, as a Young person, you, that's just interesting generally because anthropologically, you've been raised in suburbia. I was just wanted to get out of my own head. 